Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring six decades in parapsychology. With me is my old friend and mentor, Dr. Charles Tart, who is an emeritus professor of psychology at the University of California at Davis and also the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. Dr. Tart was one of my own faculty committee members when I was a graduate student in parapsychology at the University of California. He is the author of numerous books and over a hundred scientific papers in parapsychology. His books include the classic Altered States of Consciousness, an anthology, as well as States of Consciousness and Psi, Scientific Studies of the Psychic Realm, as well as Learning to Use Extrasensory Perception. Welcome, Charlie. Good to be here, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, of course, I want to acknowledge the important role that you've had in inspiring me and in guiding me to pursue my own career in parapsychology. It, well, I don't know how much I had to inspire you. You were pretty self-propelled, you know. I could give you useful information, but I didn't have to motivate you to do something. Well, you know, it was often at a distance. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you've been a pioneer long before I got into the field. You were already famous before I got started. And uh, I think our viewers would probably like to know how, what brought you into the field of parapsychology. And how's it gone for the last six decades? Well, some of my friends have kidded me that I'm basically trying to figure out how my mother did it. <laughs> Almost everybody I know had the experience as a kid. Often, many times, you're in a part of the house alone and you start to do something that you probably shouldn't be doing and from the other end of your house, your mother calls out, Jeff, what are you doing? How did she know? Yeah. They think I'm trying to figure it out. I would ask her, could she read my mind? And she'd say, of course. <laughs> of course, as a parent, I know, you know, if they're quiet, they're up to something. <laughs> but more accurately, I started out with a conventional religious background. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, who was all unconditional love for me, took me to Sunday school and then church, and if it was good enough for my grandmother, it was good enough for me. Mm -hmm. And then my teenage years came along, and I began to read extensively in science. I was in love with everything scientific, and I realized that a lot of what science said was the truth about the world was in great conflict with what religion said was true about it. Mm -hmm. I also noticed that adults were pretty hypocritical too in terms of doing what they actually preached for you to do. Mm -hmm. So I was getting more and more alienated from my religion, more and more in love with science, but feeling something was wrong, you know? I mean, there was clearly a lot of good stuff associated with religion also. In my reading, God bless the Trenton Public Library, they had a lot of old books on psychical research, as parapsychology mm -hmm. was originally called. Trenton, New Jersey. Trenton, New Jersey, yeah. yes. Any of the who, people who've crossed the bridge there over the Delaware know it says, Trenton makes, the world takes. Mm -hmm. They got me. <laughs> but they did the bridge for the Roebling Steel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I realized from my reading that this wasn't just my personal problem. This is something that a lot of intelligent people had suffered through from the 1800s when science became a powerful force in society. Yeah. And people were horrified in the sense that religion was being totally thrown out. And where would our values come from in that case? But they got the idea that scientific method had worked very well when applied in the physical world to learn more and more about things. Could we take scientific method, the essence of good observation and logical thinking about it, 
and apply it to phenomena associated with religion and spirituality mm -hmm. and start to figure out, oh yeah, this is about something real, although we're not so sure about the theory about it, the doctrine. Uh, this part of it does look like total nonsense. We can let that thing go. Mm -hmm. That has been the central theme of my career since my teenage years. Mm -hmm. Where teenage years, it was mostly reading about it, and then it's been active experiments mm -hmm. in many ways, writing, thinking, and so forth. How can I take the essence of science and use it to clarify what's there in spirituality? Now, I'm going to talk about spirituality now. Because I understand that spirituality means somebody has some overwhelming experience. And they start talking about it, and pretty soon there are committees that turn what ex they experienced into doctrine, and uh, then you get into the whole sociology of religion, which I'm mm -hmm. no expert on. But there are s experiences people have, like near-death experiences, that have profound spiritual implications for people. How much of that is based on a reality? Conviction alone isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, just because you experience something very in intensely and it's obviously the truth well that's what you experience don't not don't not count that yeah. but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true about the world so yes parapsychology for really 70 years now from my teenage years on well what drew you specifically into uh, parapsychology research because combining religion and science could have brought you into philosophy or religious studies or just conventional psychology something drew you to the paranormal mm -hmm. well the the drawing to the science part of it was partly was that i loved gadgets mm -hmm. i was a ham radio operator i learned so much electronics i was able to pass federal tests for a first class radio telephone license and work my way through college working at radio stations and the like so science had gadgets that mm -hmm. was really important yeah. and as i got older in life too i learned that talk is cheap okay and and i learned it the hard way for instance, in my 30s, I got real interested in the Japanese martial art of Aikido and arranged mm -hmm. for a black belt instructor to come up to UC Davis and teach it. And I was the advisor to the student club, so I got to train in it too. Mm -hmm. And I discovered in about three weeks, I could explain the martial art of Aikido much better than my black belt instructor. He only had high school education. I could compare it to philosophy and scientific developments and physiology and all that, except I kept noticing I couldn't actually do anything and he could toss me across the room with his little finger. <laughs> Something was not computing here. It took mm -hmm. me years to realize there was a different kind of knowledge there. And just talking good is not enough, mm -hmm. right? I, I think I had a black belt in talking by the time I was 12. Mm -hmm. And that's nice in some ways, but part of my main spiritual and psychological growth discipline in life mm -hmm. is to not be carried away by clever talking, even when I'm the person doing the clever talking. Well, you got uh, associated with Dr. Andrea Puharich yeah. back in the yeah. 1950s. He had yeah. the Round Table Foundation, as I recall, up in Maine. Puharich mm -hmm. is known these days mostly, I suppose, for his discovery of Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic. But back in those days, he he had an active research program, mm -hmm. and you became a, an associate of his. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1953, I went off to college, MIT. I thought I was going to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, that was ended by math, <laughs> which I don't have that much of a talent for. But being in Boston, I went to a number of lectures by parapsychologists, including Puharik, and Eileen Garrett, particularly that world-famous medium who started the Parapsychology Foundation, talked about the research support they had given Puharik mm -hmm. and that he had an electrical technique which could amplify extrasensory perception. Mm -hmm. And of course, that got me really excited. Uh, an electrical gadget, I understood electrical gadgets. Mm -hmm. And the problem with ESP research was that when you try to study it in the laboratory, it's generally so weak and unreliable, it doesn't happen too much of the time. It happens enough to show that it's real, but you can't produce it on demand, and then it's liable to be kind of statistically significant, but it doesn't really convince you that something real is happening. 
We had a psychic research club that we had founded. We had Puharik come down and talk, and I was fascinated mm -hmm. enough by what he'd done to mm -hmm. say, I need, I need a summer job to earn money for college. You've got a position open. So he had a research assistant position open. I earned a dollar an hour, which I thought was pretty <laughs> good back then. Yeah, back in those days. A dollar an hour in room and board, <laughs> hey, that was all right. Uh -huh. So I spent the summer at his private research foundation in Maine. That was charming. Mm -hmm. It was charming because it was a beautiful place. I'd never been in Maine before. It was an old mansion on the coast. Uh, the taxes had become too much for rich people to keep it, so they gave it to charitable places. Uh -huh. We had all sorts of interesting psychics visit. Maury Bernstein, the guy who wrote The Search for Bridie Murphy, was there a lot. Mm -hmm. Peter Herkos, the European psychic, was there. But I was especially interested in the Faraday cage research that was supposed to help ESP. Mm -hmm. Now, a Faraday cage, okay? Your car is a kind of inefficient Faraday cage. It's inefficient because it's got a lot of openings. If it was a solid metal box, then if you were struck by lightning on the outside but you were inside this solid metal box, you wouldn't feel a thing. Yeah. It's, it's the property of, of this kind of electrically conducting box that all the electricity stays on the outside. That's interesting. So you're shielded. You're shielded, yes. Yeah. You're very thoroughly shielded from anything and, electrical. And the idea for parapsychology research, I suppose, is it prevents any uh, kind of electromagnetic signal from being the source of ESP yeah. if ESP is evident. And that was important for a few people, but I think by then there was already more than enough evidence to show that whatever ESP is, it's not electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fall off with distance, for instance. You can't detect it with radio receivers. Uh, but it was, it's an interesting, it's, and it's a scientific-looking mm -hmm. environment. Well, yeah. Poharik made all sorts of experiments with Faraday cages. And his two most basic findings were that if your Faraday cage was electrically insulated from ground, right? He had a six-foot metal cube with a door in it, and it sat on glass blocks, which mm -hmm. does not conduct electricity. Mm -hmm. If you tried to do an ESP test with one person inside that way and another person outside somewhere, they generally scored a chance. It's mm -hmm. like this electrically floating, as it was technically described, Faraday cage blocked ESP. Oh. But if you connected the Faraday cage to the earth, to a six-foot rod driven into moist ground, ESP was better than under ordinary room conditions. He had an amplifier and he had a shield. And that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. He had a third condition, too, where you pump this Faraday cage up to about 5,000 volts with respect to ground which also amplified ESP, but that was getting a little too exciting. Now, you I, independently replicated some of these studies later on, didn't many you? Many years later. Yeah, I replicated the basic one. There were mm -hmm. many variations that I didn't have a chance to do. Yeah. The thing that was lacking in Puharik's work was that it wasn't double blind. Mm -hmm. That is, if you know that somebody's doing something special for you in an experiment, that can psychologically alone change your performance. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he knew, Puharik knew when he was changing these conditions, the subjects often knew. But I was able to do it years later where the experimenters and the subjects did not know what the electrical conditions were. And I didn't have the advantage Puharik had of having subjects to work with who'd already could demonstrate significant ESP scores in matching tests under mm -hmm. room conditions. I had to use college students, but these were highly motivated people in my experimental psychology class, and we got the effect. Mm -hmm. When my Faraday cage was electrically floating, they scored a chance, and when it was grounded, they scored above chance. It was a small score, but it was big enough to be statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So I figured I had basically replicated. Now, this goes on to the crazy part. Because, you know, even back in 1957, when I worked for him, I said, why isn't every parapsychologist in the world, all dozen or two dozen <laughs> of them, doing the same sort of research? Because if we could amplify ESP, we'd take a huge step forward. Yeah. You know, I used to use the analogy that our understanding of ESP then was like humanity's understanding of electricity had been for practically all of human history. You had lightning flashes, boom, and it was all over. And you had memories to work with, which might mm -hmm. be accurate or inaccurate and so forth. 
Well, you know, we have these deathbed visions and things like that, but you can't get very far yeah. with that. You also had static electrical effects. Sometimes, if you rubbed a glass rod with some fur, you might be able to pick up a feather, and it didn't always work. Yeah. You had these very weak, unreliable effects. That's what our laboratory mm. effects are like. Up until Ben Franklin came along. Right. And showed that, you know, lightning was indeed electricity. But what really changed was when the Italian Volta invented an electrical battery. Mm -hmm. Now, it was nothing compared to lightning, but it was a steady electrical current, and you could experiment with the properties of electricity. And in no time at all mm -hmm. on a human history time scale, we have video, audio, mm -hmm. all this wonderful stuff. We need the ESP battery. It looked like the Faraday cage could do it. But nobody else was replicating. You're the after work. half a century. You're the only one who even tried right. to replicate that study. That's right. Uh huh. Well, Puharich published a book long ago called Beyond Telepathy, and in that book, he argued that uh, if you're in a very relaxed uh, neurological state, I think he called it the cholinergic mm -hmm. state, yeah. you were uh, that increased your receptivity for. ESP, and if you're aroused in an adrenergic state, then you're a better telepathic sender. And nobody's ever replicated that either. Yeah. But it, it does seem to correlate well with the anecdotal literature. Yeah. And, and it also, I think there have been many studies uh, uh, correlating relaxation <laughs> techniques, hypnosis, meditation, and so on. Well, the anecdotal literature it would fit with real well is you're in the process of being horribly murdered, so you're pretty aroused <laughs> in an adrenergic state, and your mother, a thousand miles away, is asleep, and she's very relaxed in a cholinergic state, and she has a dream in which you appear or something. Yeah. But again, that's a little hard to experiment with. It, it is, but it's one of the most commonly reported yeah. spontaneous experiences that people have. But the sender has been really neglected in parapsychological research. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason for that was that telepathy made a certain kind of sense to people. You know, if I'm attempting to communicate something to you, maybe I'm sending out radio waves or quantum stuff or something, but clairvoyance, you know, here's a deck of cards in a box, write down what the order is. Nobody's looked at these cards since they've been shuffled. Nobody's sending. It's not known to anybody. Turned out, at least in most of the laboratory studies, mm -hmm. clairvoyance works just as well as telepathy experiments. Yeah. So maybe this person trying to send it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the sender's been extremely neglected, and I suspect that's a loss. But mm -hmm. Well, as you look back now over more than six decades in, in the field, uh, what is your reflection? Was, was it worthwhile? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I ran into a lot of trouble for daring to be interested in taboo subjects, but it was very exciting. Um, I'm not, we're not up to the stage where our knowledge of the spiritual and the psychic sense is so advanced that we can say prayers by Baptists are answered more often than prayers by Buddhists. <laughs> uh, don't know if we'll ever get to that yeah. stage. But there is enough evidence that I feel I can say quite confidently as a scientist that the human mind is more than the human brain. That the mind can sometimes reach out, we can call it mm -hmm. telepathy if people seem to be intending to reach it, yeah. can sometimes reach out and just pick up information about distant things, mm -hmm. call it clairvoyance, sometimes reach into the future and correctly identify stuff that hasn't even been determined yet. Mm -hmm. um, the evidence for that is overwhelming. I hate it. it precognition <laughs> makes no sense at all to me. You know, I think mm -hmm. now is now and the future hasn't happened yet, yeah. but the evidence compels me as a scientist mm -hmm. to say it happens. Now, and didn't you also do, if I remember correctly, a very interesting study showing that pre precognition scores fall off the further distant in time the target is? I did do such a study and then later somebody pointed out to be a possible flaw in it, so I added a note to it mm -hmm. saying don't take this too seriously. Uh -huh. 
Uh, it, it makes it seem more like physical stuff that we know, that the yeah. greater the distance, the less it should work. I don't know that that's true, actually. Oh, okay. And I was, I'm not, wasn't motivated mm -hmm. to do that. The, own, the main reason I have to accept clairvoyance is in some of my own research on ordinary telepathy, present time stuff. Somebody mm -hmm. now is sending, somebody now is trying to receive. I discovered massive amounts of strong precognition effects mm -hmm. that actually gave some clues as to how ESP may actually work as an information carrying system. And I was shocked, but there it was in my own laboratory data, mm -hmm. very strong. So. That you've published, uh, to my recollection, well over a hundred scientific papers. Yeah, a couple hundred actually. In I'm, parapsychology. I'm proud of that. In parapsychology, no, we'd probably go back to a hundred there. Yeah. Because, you know, I only give about a third of my time to parapsychology. You were also very active in transpersonal psychology, and you wrote a fascinating book called The End of Materialism, in which you, you basically use the data of parapsychology to argue for, I guess, what would be a, a dualist philosophical perspective. That mm -hmm. you're, you're saying we cannot explain this data uh, using a, a materialistic metaphysical framework. Right. That, that's what I was starting to talk about when I said, you know, thinking the mind is nothing but the brain is just factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. We don't know how a brain can produce consciousness in the first place, uh, although people promise it. Philosophers long ago named this promissory materialism, you know. Someday they'll explain it in terms of the brain functioning. We well, can't disprove that. Yeah. Someday they'll explain it in terms of little green men and pink flying saucers. Mm -hmm. You can't disprove <laughs> that statement either, but I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for it. Mm -hmm. So here the mind has got three ways of getting in information about things at a distance and things in the future. And also the mind can sometimes by intention alone reach out and change things. Yeah. Psychokinesis or telekinesis. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a mind then, for instance, that maybe it could survive the death of the body. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we're a long way from checking the reality of heaven. And I don't know what the ultimate limits are. But I now tend to look at all religions, and especially the, the purer spiritual traditions behind them, as people had things happen, some of which were real psychic phenomena, and they've come up with explanations for them, which turn into religious doctrines. Which, yep. That's where the science stops. Fortunately, in science, you have to understand your explanation is always subject to retesting and change. Mm -hmm. One, many a wonderful theory has had an inconvenient fact come along and <laughs> die quickly and so forth. But religions yeah. turn into doctrines, and you must not question this or you'll go to hell. That, that to me is a real inhibition of our mm -hmm. spiritual possibilities, because I think we can learn so much more about this spiritual aspect mm -hmm. of human beings. Well, it's largely establishment academics and establishment scientists who feel threatened by parapsychology, but what you're saying is that it also has implications for the theologians of various religions. Mm -hmm. And I suspect theologians are even more resistant than academics. Because by the time you come a theo become a theologian in a particular tradition, you know some doctrine inside and out, and part of your job is defending and clarifying that doctrine. Mm -hmm. You don't welcome something that simply may not do that. Let me give you an example, okay? okay. This is something we should have a lot of data on. But we have only just one small beginning of it. In Buddhism, they believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We have yeah. a lot of kids who remembered previous lives. That's very interesting material. I'm not sure there really is reincarnation. Mm -hmm. But let, let's assume it happens, okay? There's yeah. another doctrine in Buddhism that says it's extremely difficult to be reincarnated as a human being. Mm. You have to be very spiritually advanced, have very good karma to do that and not be reincarnated as an animal or in some other mm. realm and so mm -hmm. forth. So hardly anybody gets reincarnated as a human being except maybe once every thousand incarnations I know the Buddha something. himself talks about his yeah. previous incarnations as animals. Right, and mm -hmm. then, they, then they were all humans for a while, but okay. Okay, that's an interesting doctrine. 
Okay, so I made a prediction from that. I said, okay, my colleagues at the University of Virginia have several thousand cases now of kids who remember previous lives. Yeah. How many of those previous lives were people that we would think would be spiritually advanced? Monks and nuns mm -hmm. and yogis and so forth. Well, I got them scratching their heads. How many they hadn't thought of looking mm -hmm. at that? Well, there, there might be two or three among several thousand. Right. Oh, well, that doesn't support the idea that you've got to have that particular kind of karma to be mm -hmm. reincarnated as a human. Nor am I aware of any case where a young child remembers having been an animal in a previous lifetime. No, I don't remember that either. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think the jump to being a human being is so different from being an animal that it's hard to imagine going back. But mm -hmm. and this is very speculative, but, you know, I'm speculating on where we could go yeah. if we build up a solid bunch of data about this stuff. So if you look to the future of parapsychology, I think you're, you're suggesting we may be able eventually to answer the kind of questions that uh, spiritual seekers are asking. I'll say answer, but I'll qualify answer, mm -hmm. okay? Most people say, well, get an answer that it's now 100% certain that things are this way. <laughs> uh, a lot of spiritual stuff, I don't think you'll ever be 100% certain one way or the other. But now, most spiritual ideas have 1% evidence, <laughs> and the rest is all belief. Yeah. I, th I would much rather have some spiritual beliefs that had a lot of evidence in favor for them mm -hmm. rather than none at all. Mm -hmm. The conclusion I drew from my End of Materialism book to, would apply to people in general, because you know this was really written for people in general, not for parapsychologists, yeah. is the idea that science has totally disproven the spiritual is false. Mm -hmm. uh, science, mainstream science has ignored the spiritual or condemned it out of hand for philosophical reasons, but it's not been disproven. Or been There's, condemned by spiritual yeah. authorities. Yeah. yeah. Second, then, the idea that there may be some reality to spiritual effects is supported by parapsychology. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, which many of my colleagues don't like because they want to make it more like physics because yeah. there'll be less opposition that way. So the, it's reasonable to be both scientific and spiritually inclined in your life. You still need to exercise lots of discrimination in both those areas because there's mm -hmm. nonsense all over the place. But you know, you're not crazy automatically just because you think there's something to the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been taught that and suffered a great deal because of it, and it's a real shame. Dr. Charles Tart, what a pleasure to have this half hour with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for being with us.